Hi everyone, my name is Chris Theron. I am the creative director, animator, editor, and then one of the founders of Something's Arrive Productions. Uh, we're an animation studio that specializes in making creative and whimsical 3D animated content, which can range from like short films to commercial projects. Uh, we all just love like the vibrant look of 3D animation and Cinema 4D with Redshift has been our tool of choice pretty much since the beginning. I've been working professionally in 3D for around four years now and then doing it as a hobby for a few years before that. I also have an Instagram and YouTube channel where I'll post like my smaller animated films that I'll do all by myself using motion capture animation. Uh, doing these little shorts not only allows me to kind of experiment with different like visual styles and kinds of characters, uh, but it also allows me to refine my workflow so that I can create these animations uh, as quickly as possible without sort of compromising their quality. Since I often make these films all by myself, having a super optimized workflow is very important for getting them done in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and a great example of this is actually one of my most recent shorts, uh, Space Nobblers. This was like a quick animation I did back in early March, and it took me around two and a half weeks and really wouldn't have been possible without this process that I've come up with over the years. So today I thought it'd be fun to take you guys through some of the key steps in that process, uh, just as a way to show you how these days with all these like awesome programs, uh, one artist can actually create something that looks like this and they don't have to take like months and months to do it. So uh, let's just jump into it. So when starting out with any project, first thing I love to do is create a Pinterest board, just collecting all sorts of references for those types of characters, the sets, uh, just anything involved in the project itself. Um, so you can see here I've collected a number of different uh, references for my space engineer character. And just looking through all these, you can see there are a few aspects that I've sort of been inspired by and taken into my actual 2D design for the character. So we got things like the, uh, the goggles that are up over the head, um, the sort of bright orange cargo pants, which is a very sort of iconic look that I wanted to put into my own character. And then, of course, I wanted it to be this like sort of space engineer character. Um, so we got things like the tools, the tool belt, and then of course with any sci-fi engineer, you gotta have the robotic arm. So you can see here, I've actually created a number of uh, different pins for that, just sort of figuring out what that might look like. And the reason I did that is because when looking at the final design for my character, I didn't want the audience to look at her and think like, oh, how does this character actually relate to this sci-fi environment? Um, I wouldn't want anyone to mistake this space engineer for basically any normal engineer. So that's what the cybernetic arm sort of does. It grounds them in this sci-fi universe uh, and just makes them feel a little bit more different than just your average sort of engineer character. And so what I love about doing a Pinterest board is that while it might take me a while to find even like one good image, uh, once I do, I can always click on it, scroll down, and it gives me a whole number of like different uh, images that sort of relate to it. And then I can basically add them onto the board I've already made. And then over time, you're creating basically an average of the character you want to design. And so just taking a look at like my final board here, I've actually taken bits and pieces from each of the sort of pins that I've saved on here to create my own unique take on the character. So moving into actually my 2D design for it, um, I am obviously no sort of 2D artist. I, I don't do concept art or anything like that. Um, and this drawing is very much just for my own use. Um, I wouldn't give this to like a professional character designer and expect them to sort of make exactly what I'm imagining. But I do this basically as a way to uh, figure out the overall blocking of the character, get like the major shapes in there and just figure out what sort of uh, colors, what design I want to do without getting too specific because that just sort of takes up time. So looking at the character I've ended up with here, uh, you can see again, I've taken a lot of the different aspects of my Pinterest board and sort of incorporated it into the final design. So you got the goggles on the head, the uh, robot arm, and the tool belt with the orange uh, sort of cargo pants. But then I've also figured out like sort of a few other details I wanted to add while doing this sketch. Um, so things like the, uh, the patch on the pants uh, sort of imply some sort of, at least some sort of history uh, for the character. And then like a little band-aid on the arm. Once again, just to add like some nice little details. Um, in addition, I've also sort of nailed down what I want for the hairstyle. So we got the purple hair that sort of pulled back uh, behind her head. And so looking at this final design, it really illustrates my sort of thought process I go through while making these shorts. Uh, which is that I'm only one artist, uh, so anything I make has to basically be optimized uh, and not sort of bite off more than I can chew. 
So looking at the character, I've done a few things to avoid uh, certain pitfalls that might add to the, basically the overall production time. Uh, so things like the hair, I've avoided doing any hair simulations uh, by making sure that, that the hair is pinned up around the head um, and that it won't be flowing or getting in the character's face. Therefore, it just really cuts down on any, any production time when it comes to animation. And so it's the same thing with the clothing. Um, I've avoided doing any sort of cloth simulations uh, just by making the clothing a bit tighter, avoiding any sort of draping or any having any, like big wrinkles in there. Uh, and doing all that really just avoids having to take it into a separate program like Marvelous Designer uh, and having to simulate it there, which just adds the overall production time. And really, in the end, a lot of people won't be noticing whether or not I've simulated the clothing. And so once I have a character design sort of figured out, I love to jump into my favorite sculpting program, uh, which is ZBrush. Uh, ZBrush is great for doing any sort of general sculpting, but it's especially good for doing character sculpting because you're able to use this giant collection of brushes that they give you uh, to create like any sort of crazy, weird, uh, stylized character that you might want. So what's great about this compared to something like box modeling that I used to do is that instead of having to basically sort of futz around with uh, all sorts of points and vertices and you're basically able to jump right in and sculpt on top of like any mesh and just get right down to the, the fun part of it as opposed to trying to iron out all the details on say like a box. Now that being said, I am not a ZBrush expert. My knowledge of the program pretty much extends to what I need to know, which is creating these more stylized, simplistic characters. And so anything beyond that is pretty much a mystery to me. But like I said, that really just feeds into uh, the whole sort of mindset I have when creating these projects, which is making sure to have this very streamlined workflow uh, where you only do the amount of detail and the amount of work that you need to do to get the product done. So even though I don't know all the bells and whistles of ZBrush, I am still able to basically create a character that I know will work in my workflow and it will translate very well into the sort of animation that I love to do. So I actually started learning ZBrush about three years ago. Uh, and back then I actually created every character from scratch. So I would use uh, all sorts of like spheres and other shapes to create the general block out of a character. And then I would, I would combine them and refine from there. And so while I highly recommend starting out creating your own characters from scratch, uh, doing so can take me around uh, two to three days to create like a finalized, realized sculpt of a character. Um, and when you're doing a project with multiple characters and a tight deadline, you really can't afford to do that. So these days I'll actually use what's called a base mesh. And so a base mesh is a character that's already been pre-sculpted, retopologized, and UV'd, um, but done so in a very general way so, uh, so that I'm able to take that character and then sculpt details on top of it and create my own unique thing. And so using something like a base mesh, it really cuts down on the time that it takes me to create a character from around two to three days to basically one. Uh, so once I get one of these characters, I might start altering proportions, changing uh, things like the ears, changing the eye shape, uh, and just anything that really brings it back into the more stylized look. Uh, it makes it a bit closer to sort of how I like to design and sculpt my characters. Uh, one big thing I like to do is to actually change things like the head size uh, and just alter all the proportions because I don't like characters that look uh, too human, too close to reality, because it can often look a bit unsettling. So I'll always make sure to alter these and just make it look a little bit, to make it look like a little bit more stylized and like it's not just your average human character. And so a great example of this is with my most recent short film. I actually took the base mesh here and I was able to sculpt it into something that was completely unrecognizable from the original mesh. Uh, so I made the head bigger, the arms a lot skinnier and more cartoony, and then I exaggerated the belly. Uh, so that in the end, uh, you can hardly tell that one came from the other. But in the end, I bring over all that, all the topology, all the UVs, and I save a lot of time on what would normally be um, a lot of work to set up the, the fingers, the, the head, and just make sure everything looks normal before I can actually get to the fun part, which is sculpting. And the great thing about base meshes is they actually come with perfect topology uh, for animation. So you can see here that once I bring this into Cinema 4D later on, I'm able to basically sculpt all sorts of expressions onto the character uh, and it sort of deforms the face in a very natural way. And so it makes the whole facial rigging process just a lot easier after the fact. All right, this here is actually looking very creepy, but you get the idea. And so when it's all said and done, uh, this is the character I ended up with from that original base mesh. So you can see here, I've made the arms sort of a bit more muscular. I've made the head bigger, the legs shorter, uh, and just changed the overall proportions of the character to really match the original 2D design that I started out with. And another thing I've done here to sort of save on time is I've used a combination of pre-made elements, uh, elements that I bought online or 
uh, ones that I make completely from scratch. So things like uh, the boots and I believe the gloves are actually taken from a character that I worked on for a previous animation. Uh, things like the tool belt are just a model I found online and altered to sort of fit the character. Uh, and then things like the tank top and uh, the suspenders are things I just made completely from scratch uh, for the character. Uh, I also make sure to include some temp geometry to indicate like what the hair might look like so I can see sort of the overall shape uh, of the character as I'm sculpting it. And so the great thing about ZBrush is once I'm all done, I can then go up to uh, the multi-map exporter and I can export a set of displacement maps, normal maps, and then the actual mesh itself. Uh, and all these come into play when I'm doing the texturing or the shading of the character later on because uh, I'm able to bring back all this detail that I've sculpted here on a low poly mesh. So I'm able to keep the uh, polygon count really low for doing animation, but then I'm able to use these normal maps and the displacement maps to sort of bring that detail back when I'm doing the shading. So after I'm done with the character sculpt, I actually move into Mixamo.com, which is a great place to create a pretty quick, decent rig uh, for the character itself. So basically you can upload uh, the actual character model and you're able to then specify where the knees are, where the elbows are, uh, where the head is. And then the program basically takes that and figures out uh, where to put each of the skeleton pieces. And then it creates a rig based on that information, which in the end is pretty good. Uh, it's even able to rig the individual fingers of the character so you can see them moving around. So yeah, once it does that, you can sort of uh, orbit around it, see how it's looking. Uh, it's a great way for me to sort of check proportions, make sure the character looks right in motion. Um, and if I see like anything weird, like the arms too long or the, the head doesn't, doesn't feel right, then I can go back into ZBrush, edit those uh, sort of proportions and then bring them back into Mixmo and do it all again. And yeah, so once I'm all done with that, I can then uh, go through their long list of like different motion capture clips and sort of assign them to the character and see how it's like all looking uh, with all these like sort of weird random motions applied to it. So yeah, it's a lot of fun to actually just scroll through these and just try out all sorts of different looks, uh, maybe things your character might do in the short, just anything like that. And of course, it's just fun to find like a break dancing clip and uh, see what your character looks like with that, so. Then what's great about all this is once you're done, you're able to take this character rig, download it as an FBX, and then take it into a program like uh, Maya or Cinema 4D and refine it further. Because for me, I never use purely just the rig that it gives me. Uh, I always make sure to uh, refine it after I download it, uh, just making sure things deform a bit cleaner uh, and that it'll actually hold up in more close-ups and things like that. But at the same time, if you're doing like a quicker animation or the fidelity of the rig doesn't have to be too high, then this actually works great for that. And you can just take it into the program of your choice and you can just apply any sort of motion capture clips that you might want and it'll look great. So now that we have our character, uh, I can then bring this into Cinema 4D and you can see we actually have a fully realized uh, skeleton for our character. So. Uh, you can see here the arms deform, you can move them up and down, uh, and it all looks pretty good. Uh, you can like bend the elbow, you know, some 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 weirder deformations, but overall uh, this will hold up great for like the kind of animations we need to do here. Um, there are a few spots, of course, where it's like uh, where I definitely would go back in uh, and fix it a bit. You can see the uh, robotic arm doesn't quite deform correctly. Uh, it's a bit of weirdness, but especially if you're not going to do any close-ups of this, or any sort of extreme motions, then this works great. So you always want to make sure to check all this, make sure it all looks sort of uh, pretty normal. There's no glaring issues uh, that'll come back to bite you. Uh, everything looks pretty good here. So I'm going to move into actually rigging it for motion capture. And this is something where there's not really a clear guide online uh, for how to do this in Cinema 4D. Uh, and so it's something I've actually figured out through a lot of trial and error over the years. Um, as to like what sort of parameters you have to set to make sure uh, the motion capture data I get from my motion capture suit actually works with my character. So, so for my own personal workflow, I use the motion system tag uh, in Cinema 4D. And what that lets us do is once I apply it to the hips, I can then go into the motion mode. Uh, and this gives us access to a whole timeline for the character where I can then uh, drag and drop all these motion capture clips I have here. Uh, I can then mix and match them, uh, fade one into the other, or sort of speed them up or slow them down. So it's just a great like area in Cinema 4D where you can create like a, a timeline for the motion capture data uh, and puts it all in like one easy to see uh, and understand place. So 
uh, here we have a older clip I've done and let's just apply this to our rig as we have it now and see how it looks. All right, so it has disappeared. Um, you can see the scale first off of the character is completely wrong. Um, so right now I believe the character is about, uh, I think like two inches tall when it should be, uh, I think around, you know, six foot. So we're gonna have to fix that. Um, so if we go into the attributes of our hips, go into coordinates, you can see we can actually mess with the scale here. Uh, and so what you have to do is basically uh, keep changing these numbers until the character uh, looks around the same scale as the actual skeleton. So let's start something like 10. And that's getting us there, but it's still definitely too small. Let's try 15. All right, now you can see we're starting to get pretty close here. Um, you can see that the head is basically lining up with uh, where it is on the actual motion capture data. But the problem is the legs and the arms are doing something really weird. And this is something I had a lot of issue with back in the day um, because there wasn't any clear issues as to why this might be happening. Uh, but over time, I sort of figure out what the problem was. So let's undo all that. You need to uh, prepare your character in a very specific way uh, to get them ready for motion capture. So the problem here is if I were to hide the geometry and zoom in on these joints, uh, you can see that the direction they face is very important for motion capture. So here you have the y-axis points up while the z-axis points backwards, which is the way we want it on all the joints. But if we were to click on the arms, you can see that actually the y-axis is pointing down the arm while the z-axis is pointing up to the sky. And this is the same for most of the joints on the character. Uh, all the hands, they're all messed up. And same with the legs, they're all inverted, which is why we got that strange look when we applied the actual motion capture data. So the way you fix this is it's a fairly manual process, uh, but it doesn't take more than around like five minutes and it's super important to getting the motion capture right. So what we're gonna do here is uh, first step, we're going to find all the skin objects for each of the rigged objects and just turn those off. So now that those are off, we can then go into each of our individual joints, hit the uh, enable axis, and this will basically allow us to edit the direction, the orientation of each of the joints without moving the skeleton itself. So if I hold down shift, I can then drag this 180 degrees. So now the Y is pointing up, hit the axis again, and now it's locked. Go to the next joint and continue doing this for each of the joints. Um, so again, it's a fairly manual process, but it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, the only ones where it's actually correct is the hips and the spine and up to the head, all those are, are as they should be, but everything else uh, still needs to be corrected. So uh, let's just make sure, let's just do this for each of the joints, make sure that the X axis, the red, uh, the red line is always pointing uh, the direction of the joints. So in this case, it does need to point down. And yeah, we just go through all of these. I'm also using the L shortcut to enable and disable the axis so I can edit it without having to click that button. So these are just moving at 90 degrees and hit the L again, and then doing it for the hand. Now, normally I would also do this on the fingers themselves, but for the sake of uh, not taking a longer time, I'm going to uh, just avoid that for now. Uh, for the other side of the character, you need to basically invert the direction the X axis points. So this way it's always pointing uh, it's always pointing to basically this area, the right side of the screen, uh, regardless of whichever joint it is. So that's, you just have to make sure it's all consistent across the character, um, or otherwise your motion capture data will not work. All right, and last but not least, let's just do the last legs. The legs are really easy because you can just turn them 180 uh, and then they'll be correct. There we go. And then for the actual feet, I like to basically uh, go into the coordinates, hit the L and then just zero them out so that they are actually just pointing straight forward. And you can see when I zero them all out, it actually corrects them. So they're pointing the actual way.
So let's just do that. Hit the L again. And then the toes. Just zero everything out. All right, and there we go. Now the character is ready for motion capture. Uh, last bit that's very important. Hit. Uh, you see here we have all the weight tags. So select them all and hit set bind pose. This will basically uh, attach your character to this new corrected skeleton so that when I go back in, find all the skin objects, I can then re-enable them. And now once I reveal my character, you can see that it all looks normal. Uh, so now that the character is corrected, I can then go into our motion system, reassign this our uh, motion system tag, and then apply the motion capture data to the character itself. So once again, we have our last issue, which is the character is just way too small. So what I like to do, I think 15 was about where it looked right. So let's try that. All right, that looks a lot better, uh, but you can see that the feet uh, where the bottom of the feet do not line up with the bottom of the motion capture is. Um, and that's very important because if those don't match, your character is going to be sliding around uh, just ever so slightly. So you got to make sure that it sort of matches. So let's try and s to do 17. Uh, and that looks pretty close. You can see it's that's the bottom and this is the bottom of the shoe. So you can see if we zoom out, ignoring the fingers, which we did not correct, uh, the rest of the character looks pretty normal. So like I said, in this motion system tag, uh, I can then take this clip and stretch it out uh, till it says 100% on it. And that means that the clip and the animation are running at the uh, speed they were recorded at. There we go. And then we hit play and our character is running. So let's just extend this out to 400 frames. And yeah, you can see the character itself now has motion capture data applied. All right, so here's a quick look at the actual facial rig for the character. Um, you see here I've got a, a few different simple controls here. So we have stuff for the eyes, so we can move those all around. Uh, we have a few different positions for the hands. Right now they just have a rest position, so I can undo that. Uh, and then if I wanted, the character can make do fists, uh, or they could, or they could do a simple point. Um, and I do these sort of uh, preset hand positions because the character itself is simple enough where it doesn't really need to have the sort of fine-tuned control that you might need in a more professional, like Hollywood-level character rig. Uh, so these like simple like four options get the job done. And if I need something more specific, I'll go into it and animate it myself. But for the broad range of uh, actions this character is going to do. These will work just fine. And now we get into the actual main part of the character, which is the facial rig. Uh, now, facial rigs for me were a mystery for the longest time. Uh, I could not find like any sort of um, good walkthroughs or just explanations of like uh, how to make one, how to create one that's like expressive um, and just does what I need it to do without it being a whole lot of work to make. Uh, so this whole sort of uh, layout is something I came up with myself. Uh, way back when, and since then I've just been copying and pasting this whole uh, control panel between all my characters, uh, so I know how they work and you know it gets the job done. If I were to go through a few of these controls, you can see I can slide it over and make the character smile. I can do things like a sneer. I can open the mouth. Uh, she can do things like blinks uh, or maybe do a frown or a smile. And what's great about the way I set this up uh, is that we can mix and match each of these things together. So if I were to make her smile, I can also add in some sneer uh, and maybe some of this. And you can see we get like, uh, we can get a good combination of uh, different faces just by combining each of these uh, weird different um, sort of controls that I've, that I've added here. So. Um, so if I wanted the character to be really mad, I can add some more sneer, uh, maybe some of this, and then add some, maybe some stretch to the mouth to make it a bit wider. And now we have a pretty decent expression with not much work. 
Now, the thing to keep in mind about uh, this process is it's not going to hold up again for, uh, say, a Pixar level character. Um, for instance, this character has no way to speak. I didn't bother uh, sort of uh, creating different mouth shapes to do various sentences. So uh, if this were more cinematic, more uh, movie level project, I would actually have bothered to do that. But since it's a quicker short, uh, I figure uh, just covering a broad range of emotions is basically the best I can do. Uh, and it really saves on time, only having to worry about uh, doing smiles and sneers and frowns and things like that. And so the way I set this up is it all revolves around a blend shape. Uh, so what are blend shapes? Basically, uh, in Cinema 4D at least, a blend shape is a part of the Pose Morph tag, where if I apply this onto the character itself, I can then go into the Attributes, uh, click on Points, and now we have access to all the blend shape tools that we'll need. So a blend shape is basically, if I were to create this pose zero and name it just test, I can then go into my sculpting tools uh, and say I wanted to make the character smile, I can then do, <laughs> create something pretty weird uh, like this, and now we have a blend shape. So if I were to go from edit to animate, you can see now we can slide this slider and it basically creates a, a little animation for us. So now imagine taking this concept and applying it to basically the broad range of facial expressions, and that's basically how I create this whole facial rig. And so after a few projects, I've created this whole chart of various facial expressions that I know I'll need uh, to create a character that's expressive enough without having to go overboard and creating uh, a number of blend shapes that I know I won't use. So going through here, you can see we have uh, ones for smiling, frowning, uh, sneers, stretches, uh, wide eyes, and then various blinks and other things like that. Um, you see I've also labeled them L smile, L frown, L sneer. And the reason for that is for this chart at least, uh, I didn't bother making the right side uh, since they're just going to be mirror images of each other, which I'll show you guys in a second. So basically I'll create a smile for the left side of the face and then I'll take that mirror it and then make that the smile for the right side of the face. So I have control over each side. So I'll always have this open as sort of a reference while I'm creating these, just to make sure I have the right list of things done. And it's just a pretty helpful list to have around um, in case you ever want to know what each of the shapes should look like. So real quick, let's create a few of them so I can just do a, a quick demonstration here. Uh, let's add a pose, call it L smile. And now we can just take our character and sort of start to subtly model uh, these additional shapes onto it. Uh, And you can use all the sort of sculpting tools that Cinema 4D has, but for me, I find uh, just using the grab tool is pretty much all I'll need. And there we go. So this is a very quick example, but you see now we have this smile. We can test the uh, the strength here, see if it looks right. And that's looking pretty good. So uh, now that I like that, I'm going to mirror it. So I'm going to do copy, paste, and then selecting it, I'll do uh, flip X, which will put it onto the other side. And now I just have to rename it our smile. And now we have both sides of the face. So if you see, if we go to animate, uh, now we have this kind of creepy smile, but you know, if I were to refine it a bit more, uh, it would look a bit better. So now you can see here, we can combine them, mix and match, and we have a, a whole facial rig. And now, so how do I uh, rig all these up basically? So the way I do this, if I were to open up the actual face controls that I've made. This is all done using the Expresso tag. And if I open this up, you can see it's actually a whole tangle of nodes uh, that I've made, basically connecting the blend shapes themselves through the this giant pose morph uh, window and the controls that I've made. So it might look like a lot, but it's actually uh, a very simple process. I, I'm very basic when it comes to Expresso, so anything I do in it is bound to be pretty simple. So if I were to demonstrate that real quick, let's just create a spline. And let's scale that down. So say this was uh, our control for the open mouth. So let's just call this open, open smile. So if we were to apply the Expresso tag, all right, and what you can do in Expresso is you can actually just drag each of these in here. So we have our tool now. And if we go to our pose morph tag, we can drag that in as well. 
and now we have both the control and the pose morph tag itself. If you just click on the uh, this blue area, you can see we have a few options. So we have uh, L smile enable, L smile strength, uh, and all we have to worry about is adding in the strength. So that's going to be the amount that uh, the amount that it's sort of blended into the original shape. So let's just add all three of our strengths here. And so now you see we have those all laid out. And for the actual smile, we want to basically make it so that the higher this control is, the more the character is going to smile. Let's give ourselves access to the Y axis of this control. So if we go into coordinates, transform, position, um, let's do position Y. So if we add in a result node, we can connect it there and we can see that it actually is updating as we move our uh, control up and down. So now we just need one more thing in between these, which is the range mapper node. And what the range mapper does is it'll take basically this data, if we put it into the input, and it will translate it into sort of a percentage. So the higher this is, the more it goes up to 100%, and the lower it is, uh, the more it goes down to 0%. So let's say when the uh, control is down here, it's going to be at 0%. And when it's up here at say 11 centimeters high, it's at 100%. So if we go into the range mapper, let's say um, that the lowest point it's going to be at is nine centimeters. The highest point this control is gonna to go to is 11 centimeters. What it's going to basically do is um, convert that to a percentage. So if we change the output range to percent, you can see now it goes from zero to 100%. So again, at nine, it's at 0%, and at 11, it's at 100%. And now all we have to do is uh, connect this percentage into the open mouth, and there we go. Now it's being controlled by the, uh, by the control. And so if I actually keep going above the range we specified, it actually gets more and more intense. Uh, and same if I were to go below it, it goes the opposite way. Um, and the way you can fix that is just by clicking on the range mapper node and doing clamp lower and clamp upper, which means once it hits this maximum, it won't go above 100%. And so the character uh, behaves how they should. So that's basically how you put together the facial rig. Um, and you just basically repeat this for every single uh, blend shape. But the beauty of it is that once you have it all set up, you can actually copy and paste this uh, facial rig between setups and then apply your new blend shapes to that. So you can see here, I can just take this old facial rig I have, drag in my new pose morph, and then do say open smile strength. And now I can just find where that connects to in the old one, open smile, and connect it into our new pose morph. Uh, you can see here, now we have a rigged character. All right, so now that we have this fully realized character with the facial rig, uh, and it's all ready for a mocap, we can then go into the actual motion capture process. So here's a video of me uh, doing the animation for this short. Uh, I personally use the Perception Neuron 3 I do look pretty ridiculous while I'm doing it, but it all works out in the end. So I'll do a number of different takes, as you can see here, uh, basically doing slightly different performances. And I'll keep doing this for several minutes until I feel like I have a good uh, set of options to choose from. And you can see I've also found a chair that generally imitates the sort of shape of the one I'm going to be using in the animation. And then I'm also sort of miming out the action of being swung from right to left as the character does in the scene. So that way I can get some, a bit more interactive animation when I actually put it into the scene itself. So now that we have that loaded, you can see uh, that it's pretty much what I did one-to-one. -one. So now that we have that, we click on the hips, go to animate, and then uh, add motion clip. We can name it test animation. So now if we go into uh, the motion mode, we see we now have our test animation. And then if we want to switch this between projects, we can do uh, save motion source preset and then name it again. Now that we have it saved, we can go into open motion source preset and then we have our animation. 
Uh, last thing I do is I make sure that the bones themselves match up uh, with the bones of our character. So you can see here we have uh, the girl, the hips at the top with the right leg, left leg, spine, and so on. And you can see it's mostly one-to-one. -one. Uh, the, the one thing I have to do is make sure to get rid of this extra neck joint. So I just delete that. And now we can just apply this to the character. So let's stretch this out so it's playing at normal speed. Now you can see it is applied to the character and it's looking pretty good. Uh, so one way I can clean up the animation a bit uh, is by clicking on the girl layer, going into the attributes of the motion system and hitting add. What this does is it puts in another layer. Uh, let's just bring this on top of our motion capture data. And what this pretty much is, is an extra animation layer that will then make adjustments to the motion capture data underneath it. Uh, so if I wanted to animate the arm raising up here, uh, first off, what I have to do for some reason is I have to wiggle the arm just a little bit, make sure the joint is just slightly offset for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure why, but this tells Cinema 4D uh, that I'm going to animate this arm. So now that I've done that, I can add a keyframe, move further on, and then raise the arm up and add a second keyframe. And now you can see we've added some extra motion data on top of it. And this is basically the process I do for any uh, any of the joints or anything that might look weird. So you can see here that uh, the arm is actually intersecting with the body just a little bit. So what I might do for the entire animation is I'll just rotate that out slightly and add a keyframe. So now you can see it's a bit better. So a very important tool I like to use with mocap is IK. Uh, and what this will do is basically if I were to select the leg and then the base of the foot and then go into character, create IK chain, you see we now got this green line going from the leg to the foot. And now if I were to click on this new object that was just created, you see I now have complete control over the leg and it's actually overrided the motion capture data. So if I were to move this over, uh, you can see here, uh, ignoring this issue with the shoe, that the leg actually does stay in the same exact place. Uh, and this is basically how you get the character's legs and arms to stay where you want them to be. Um, so for instance, this character is meant to be holding uh, a sort of controller. So if we go into the actual file, you can see I've created uh, IK for both arms so that now if I were to rotate this controller around that the arms actually follow it one to one. And so one last motion capture tip is that sometimes you might need to transition from doing IK animation to motion capture animation. Yeah, so say I've added a IK chain to this hand here. You can see that now the actual arm is gonna be stuck in place for the entire animation, which we don't want. Um, so we're gonna actually have to transition uh, from the IK to the motion capture data. So the way I do this is if I click on here, you see I've actually created uh, on the arm an IK tag. So yeah, you can see there's actually an IK to FK slider here. Um, so on what, if it's at 0%, it's completely IK. And if it's at 100%, it's FK. Uh, and FK basically is going back to whatever keyframed animation we might have. Uh, so if I were to slide it, you see the arm moves just slightly, but that's actually not the motion capture data. Um, so what we actually have to do if we want to be able to seamlessly move between IK and FK animation, if we have to click on the girl in the motion mode, go up to motion system and then convert layer to keyframe animation. And what that does is it just bakes down uh, all our motion capture data, all the sort of cleanup we did on top of that and puts it into a bunch of keyframes that aren't part of this motion mode uh, area. All right, and now you see down here, we have all these keyframes. So every frame has now been converted and everything looks the same. Uh, but now if we go into our IKFK, if we slide this, you see it goes right into the motion capture data. So moving on to actually lighting the scene, uh, you can see in here in the final frame that the lighting actually feels pretty simple. It's seemingly just like a single sunlight object shining through the window uh, and sort of illuminating the scene inside with of course like a few extra lights, but it, there's actually much more to it. So if I were to remove every light that's not the sunlight, the scene becomes actually very dark. Uh, and that's because I have tons of invisible lights uh, scattered throughout the scene, highlighting different uh, important parts of it. So I like to think of this as basically painting with light. 
um, because you're able to then take these invisible area lights and just scatter them throughout the scene uh, to highlight certain areas of the frame. So there, for instance, there's one up here that gives her hair uh, this rim light along with her hat. Uh, there's another one in this corner here that highlights basically the figures and the computers. Another one for the for the bed itself, and then a bunch more that basically uh, fake this sort of global illumination that we might get from the sunlight object itself. And now you might wonder, like, why do we not just use a very bright sunlight uh, object that just shines through the window and illuminates everything naturally? Uh, and the reason for this is basically because it gives you a lot more control if you break it up into these individual lights. So if I wanted this bed to be a little bit darker, I can just change those values, which I really couldn't do if it was just lit by the sun. So if you actually look at the scene itself, uh, you'll see all these invisible area lights uh, throughout the, the whole setup. So if I highlight them, you see there's actually around, I think, 20 of them. Uh, highlighting different parts of the scene. So we have, again, the one up here that sort of shines down to basically imitate this, this blue flare that we have uh, in the space background. Uh, same with another one that highlights sort of the goggles. And then there's even a third one right here that, that is just shining on her face that, gives, uh, that basically separates it more from the background and makes it feel a bit brighter. And one more thing I like to do while designing the scene is I'll put in a lot of practical lights. These are basically physical lights that motivate uh, how I light the entire scene. So for instance, the tube light over here that sort of shines down on the computer, that's an example of a good practical light. And the biggest one of all is the two flares that are happening in the space background. And these basically motivate the warm light that we see on our face, uh, while also motivating the blue cool rim light that we have on the back of her head. And this just creates a very interesting sort of color contrast that I really wanted to have for the scene. So one more time, before and after, uh, is just a big difference when we add in all these invisible lights. So one more thing you need to keep in mind before you render is it's really important to use AOVs when you export the animation. An AOV is basically a separate pass that the renderer goes through uh, that just gives you basically more information to work with when you're doing compositing. You can see here I have one for the depth, so how far away things are from the camera, um, stuff for all the volumetrics like the, the haze that you get from the TV, um, things that are glowing, and then we have a whole bunch of puzzle mats. What you'll see a puzzle mat is later on uh, is basically a way to create a mask in After Effects that you can then use to basically adjust the light values, the colors, or really anything of whatever object you made a puzzle mat out of. So basically like the 10 you see here are highlighting different parts of the scene that I think might be important uh, and that I might want to change the values of later. So things like the girl's face, her cap, the bed, uh, just things like that. So I have much more control during compositing to sort of tweak the values and make it seem exactly right. So with all that said and done, we now move into the final stage, which is compositing. Uh, now compositing for me, again, was one of the biggest mysteries of all time. There wasn't like a clear explanation of it online uh, and how it might be used from scene to scene. And the reason for that is because it really does depend. Some scenes you might just use it to add like a vignette or change the levels, um, while for others you might be altering the colors of characters' outfits, adding smoke, adding fire, lens flares, all sorts of elements that basically are things that a 3D program just can't quite fake. So for Space Nobblers, it was actually pretty simple. Uh, this was basically the final render I got after many hours of letting that run. You can see it actually looks pretty similar to the final look of the short, um, but there are some key differences. Yeah, so if we move over here, you can see this was before compositing, and then this was after. So what I really did is de-emphasize a lot of parts of the scene. Uh, you can see I've added things like a vignette, I've blurred the edges, I made the space background a lot more subtle, and then I added a lot of smudges onto the window itself. Um, and I did all these because when I brought it into After Effects, uh, I was looking at it and my eye was just getting lost in all the detail. Everything was very sharp, crisp, in focus, uh, and of course, well lit. So. Um, that kind of made it a bit of a mess to try and find where the focal point was. So what I really wanted to do was just de-emphasize all that um, by darkening the edges, making sure every things were a bit blurry where I didn't want people to look, uh, and then just making sure that this space background didn't sort of compete with the uh, actual subjects of the film. Because you can see in the original version, it was a bit strong, uh, the stars were very bright, and everything just kind of felt a bit lost. Uh, so I took that and sort of just turned down the stars, turned down uh, the planets, and made the window a lot smudgier as a way to basically separate the characters from the background. 
So here's all the passes that I got out of my AOVs. And you can see most of them are these uh, red, green, and blue puzzle mats. Uh, and so what those basically do is I've highlighted a number of different objects in every uh, puzzle mat that I exported. So here I have the background along with the candy. Um, here it might be the, the metal plating on the ship and the counters. And then here we have like, we have the gun itself, the chair, uh, and all sorts of things. So every piece here I can then take into After Effects, uh, separate, and then adjust the levels. Uh, so one way I might do that is I have this puzzle mat of the computer. So to actually isolate this as its own mask, I would then uh, make a duplicate of the render, go into, uh, go into set mat, and then I can actually select the puzzle mat right above it where it says use for mat instead of alpha channel, I would set it to whatever color uh, the mat I wanted to isolate is. So in this case, it's green. And so now if you actually solo this, you see the computer is now its own separate layer that I can then basically drag any sort of effects onto it and control it from there. So if I wanted to basically make it a bit brighter in the scene, I can do that and it basically animates in a very seamless way. And that's just one example of all the things I can do with these puzzle mats that I exported. And it's the reason why I basically export uh, a ton of them every time I do an animation. So for me, compositing is really about having uh, the maximum amount of control over the scene after I render it. And so the last big bit of compositing I did here is if you actually look at the original scene, there's no candy that's being fired out of the gun. Instead, the gun is miming the motions. Uh, the alien is actually uh, having candy pop into their mouth, but there's nothing to bridge the gap between the two. And the reason I did this is I originally tried to do it using a physics simulation in Cinema 4D, but it just didn't look right. The speed was too slow and it was often like bouncing off of the alien instead of going into the mouth and sort of collecting there. So I decided this would actually be a very easy thing to do in After Effects using Trap Code Particular. So you can see here I made actually a separate candy render where it just spins around and changes colors. So I'm actually able to take that and make a trap code particular effect. And I'm very inexperienced in this program, but uh, I knew because it was basically just spawning this sprite and making it shoot out into space that it could be a very simple effect. And then all the motion blur basically covers up any mistakes that I might've made. So you can see here we have the base particular effect, uh, basically just a bunch of white dots sprouting from the center. First things first, I would want to go into the particle uh, instead of sphere we want a sprite in the sprite controls we can select our flying candy to act as that sprite so now if i actually scale up our particles you can see we actually have a whole bunch of candies now they're just spawning from the center so let's increase that speed now we just have this crazy looking particle effect. So if I actually wanna make these shoot off in a certain direction, I can then go down to environment and change the wind direction. And that'll basically tell it to move in a very particular direction. So if I were to crank this uh, all the way up, you can see now they actually retreat into the background as they're fired. So I can actually also tell this to move slightly over. And now you have this crazy looking uh, cannon effect. And if we want to, we can also add uh, a bunch of motion blur over the top of it, which will make it uh, take a lot longer to render, but it'll look a lot more realistic in the end. And that's pretty much like the basics of how you sort of achieve this uh, this simple particle effect. And that's it. Uh, I know that was a lot of stuff to get through, but hopefully you picked up a thing or two. Again, this is all just to show that yes, it is possible for one artist to create something if they're super efficient about it. You gotta be sure not to do like too much extra work that no one will really notice because like cutting out all those extra bits helps optimize the whole workflow. Uh, so you can create like some awesome animations in like a relatively short amount of time. Uh, anyways, uh, feel free to check out some of my other animations on my Instagram or YouTube. Uh, I always have a lot of fun making those and you can see more about Something's Awry over on our website. Uh, thanks so much to Maxlin for having me here and I'll see you guys next time.